بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us the tawfiq to come into his house and fulfill the compulsory duty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed on our, shul- our shoulders. And we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making us amongst the ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send his salutations, peace and blessings upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family, his companions and all of those who follow his way till the day of Qiyamah. We find ourselves around the end of the Gregorian calendar, the end of the year. And as we know, in Islam we have our own calendar, we have our own new year. But us being in this environment where we use this calendar, as you know, if you ask someone what is the date, they'll know the Gregorian date, not necessarily the Hijri date. So we follow this calendar. So naturally, we have a certain expectation. At the end of the year, everyone starts making their resolutions. I'm going to change this about myself. I'm going to start the new year with something else. I'm gonna change different aspects that I dislike about myself. But if you really think about it, there's no real difference between the last day of the year and the first day of the year. The sun will set and the sun will rise we will go to sleep, we will wake up. Everything is the same. So these expectations that we have that we are somehow going to change or we want to motivate ourselves for this change, we can do it at any time. But I feel that you know, regardless of what I say and what we know, we are still going to have these expectations, we're still going to have these resolutions. So I wanted to highlight something which can be a resolution for us. If we're going to make resolutions, let us make one that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recommended. Let us make one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. And what greater resolution than decreasing the amount of dunya in our lives? This is something that Allah wants. This is something that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam practiced, shared with the Sahaba, they practiced. And every pious individual who came after them, who followed the Quran and Sunnah, also practiced. So this is something that we can aspire for. This is something that we can put on our list, inshallah, that I want to decrease my connection with the dunya. I want to increase my connection with the akhirah. And truly, this actually happens naturally if we start applying the sharia into our lives. If we recite the Quran, if we read the ahadith, and we start practicing on it, we start pondering over its meanings, we will understand that naturally we should disincline towards this dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Mulk, many of us have Surah Al-Mulk memorized, there's many virtues for memorizing Surah Al-Mulk and reciting it every night, such as being saved from the punishment of the grave. In the first two verses of Surah Al-Mulk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the purpose of life. Allah says, تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ الْمُلْكِ وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Blessed is the individual, blessed is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in whose hands lies the dominion, in whose hands lies the sovereignty, in whose hands lies the heavens and the earth and all of creation. And he has power over everything. He is the true source of power. Blessed is he. In the second ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the purpose of life. Why did He create us? What is our purpose of being created? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He is the one who has created death and life. Allah is the one who creates these. Death is a creation of Allah. Life is a creation of Allah. He's the one that made them. Why did He make them for us? What is our purpose in this? Why do we have life? We had a period of nothingness. Allah brought us into life. Now we have life. And this life will soon end. Very soon. He did this. He wanted to see which one of you is the best in their deeds. This is the purpose. 
Why are you alive? Why am I alive? Why do we experience life? Why do we experience death? So we can show Allah how much amal we can do. This is the purpose of life. To show Allah. Allah already knows. He knows everything. He knows what we are going to do. But we need to make it a point that I am going to show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what I can do. You know when a person is very determined, they say, oh, I'll show you. You don't think I can do it? I'll show you. I can do it. And then through that determination, they go beyond all expectations. This is what Allah wants from us. To, for us to display our determination, to do ibadah, to step away from the desires and the luxuries of dunya, and to turn towards Allah. This is what He wants. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about dunya in the Quran very often. The whole point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made dunya very beautiful. In one hadith we'll mention further later on, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa tells us, Inna dunya hulwatun khadira. The dunya is very sweet. The dunya is very green. Sweet in one sense. Everyone likes sweets. Or most people at least like sweets. And that's why we use this word sweet as an example of something that you desire. And everyone likes green things as well. Or if you go outside, things are not, no longer green. It's very difficult to stand outside right now. In the summer or in the spring when things are blooming, things are green. We just happen to enjoy ourselves. Just waking up in, in a spring day, you feel great. Waking up today, you might not feel so great. It's kind of cold. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi says the dunya is like this. It's sweet and it's green. Meaning it's, it's a very attractive thing. Naturally. Allah has made dunya attractive. And that's why everyone is attracted to dunya. You can say you're not, but you're just lying to yourself. Allah has made every insan attracted to dunya. Why has Allah done this? وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ مُسْتَخْلِفُكُمْ فِيهَا Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Allah has made you a khalifa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made you a vicegerent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth. He has made you a represent, representative of his ahkam on earth. He wants to see how you do. فَيَنْظُرَ كَيْفَ تَعْمَلُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will see how you behave. Allah wants to see how we behave. So this is actually a test. This dunya is an examination hall. Imagine, Many of us have taken the SATs. You sign up for this SAT. You have to pay for the test as well. When I was studying, it was $50. Someone told me it's now $60. They're just increasing the amount. So you have to pay for a test. So you go to the examination hall, and you write your exam, and then you get your results, and then you can apply to a college or university based off of your results. This dunya is the perfect test. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this like an examination. It is an examination. Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created difficulties. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created pleasures. And He has created us with a nafs, a desire that, that goes towards the pleasures. And He has told us, don't go towards the pleasures. So this is what, what a test entails. A test entails difficult questions, difficult scenarios that you have to overcome. Trials and tribulations that you have to overcome. In the SATs, it's not that big of a deal. You know, maybe some analogies. I think they took the analogies out now. When I was studying, they used to have the analogies like, you know, water is to fire as fulan is to fulan. I don't think they have that anymore. But they have different sections. So various trials in the SATs you're taking, you have to overcome that. Dunya is the same. But it's even much more difficult. It's so difficult that you forget you're taking a test. And this is one of the Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying that dunya has been made very green, very beautiful. Allah has placed you in the dunya so He can see how you behave. This is the purpose. He's made us attracted to certain things and made those things available as well. And He wants to see, can you step away from it? Can you disengage? Can you disobey your desires? Disobey what people are telling you? Disobey what the shayateen say? Disobey what society wants you to do? And can you follow what Allah says? Can you follow what Rasulullah sallallahu says? And it's going to contradict. What Allah wants is not what society wants necessarily. What Allah wants is not what media wants. What Allah wants is not what shaitan wants. What Allah wants is not necessarily what we want. Can you sacrifice what you want for what Allah wants? This is the test. And this is what dunya is all about. So can we overcome this? This is what Allah wants to see. And like I was mentioning, our resolution should be, I want to overcome. How do we overcome? We extract the love that we have of dunya from our hearts. 
Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one hadith, he says, The hubbu dunya raksu kulli khatiyah. The love of dunya is the source of all sin. Whatever sin that we do, it stems, where does it stem from? The love of dunya. Every single sin that a person does, it will come from their love of dunya. And in another hadith, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Kullu bani adam khatta wa khayru al-khatta'ina tawabun. Every individual, every human being is a sinner. Everyone, naturally, we sin. But the best among the sinners are those who do tawbah, the return to Allah. So when we combine these two narrations, on one hand, the dunya is a source of evil. On the other hand, everyone sins. What does this mean? Everyone loves dunya. Because of dunya, we're doing the sins and everyone is a sinner. So naturally, we incline towards this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about dunya in the Quran in many different examples. In Surah Yunus, verse 24, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا مَثَلُ الْحَيَاةِ dunya." The example of the life of this world. Allah gives us an example. كَمَا إِنْ أَنزَلْنَاهُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ Like water and rain that comes down and descends from the skies. When it rains. فَاخْتَلَطَ بِهِ نَبَاتِ فِي الْأَرْضِ It mixes with the earth. The rainwater comes, it mixes with the soil, and then crops grow. مِمَّا يَأْكُلُ النَّاسُ وَالْأَنْعَامِ Things grow that people eat, that animals eat. حَتَّى إِذَا أَخَذَتِ الْأَرْضُ زُخْرُفَهَا وَزَّيَّنَتْ When the earth becomes very beautiful. Right, so the rain comes down, the earth swallows it up, and it grows different crops. Depending on what seed was planted, a different crop is going to grow. You can have fruits, you can have vegetables, whatever you want. And people learn how to manipulate that, so we grow crops. And then it becomes very beautiful. They start blooming, there's flowers. You get very excited when you start seeing your fruits starting to grow. Those of you who garden, you would know that excitement. And then the people, they think that I have power over it. Alhamdulillah, my fruit tree has grown. I got lemons, I got apples, I got figs. You get very happy. In the spring, you start seeing the little blossoms grow. So you start feeling like, I'm going to eat soon. Alhamdulillah. When that happens, أَتَاهَا أَمْرُنَا لَيْلًا أَوْ نَهَارًا Allah's command comes in the night or in the day. What is this command that Allah is talking about? A disaster. A disaster comes. Maybe a very cold, chilling wind comes. A cold front. Maybe some type of hurricane, a tornado, or a fire comes. فَجَعَلْنَاهَا حَصِيدًا كَأَنْ لَمْ تَغْنَ بِالْأَمْسِ Allah says we make this completely flattened. Everything's gone. As if it was not even there. كَذَلِكَ نُفَصِّلُ الْآيَاتِ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ in this manner, Allah explains His verses for people who would think deeply upon it. So in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, this is dunya. And He compares dunya with something that we should all understand. People back in the day all did understand. Nowadays, we need a different example, that of social media of, or some kind of electronic. You go to the store, you buy some kind of device, and then it malfunctions. That's what our kids would understand today. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the dunya is like a gardener. You are experiencing dunya, you're like a gardener. You plant your seed, you're hoping, you have desires. And then Allah's rain comes down. You wait for the rain, it comes down. The crops grow, alhamdulillah, you're happy. You're waiting for those fruits. But right before you get what you want, Allah destroys everything. And this is the dunya. You have expectations. I wanna reach, the, I wanna attain this much money. I wanna go this far with my career. I want my children to have this and that. I want my family this, 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 that. Different aspects of dunya. But you are not guaranteed that success. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, something can happen that you have no control over and wipe everything out. What do you do then? When you put your hopes in your own efforts, this is the result. And when we put our hopes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that will never finish. Because Allah stores that for us in the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another verse in Surah Al-Hadid, verse number 20, He says, I'lamu, understand, أَنَّمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا لَعِبٌ وَلَهْبٌ وَزِينَةٌ وَتَفَاخُرٌ بَيْنَكُمْ وَتَكَاثُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ 
understand that the life of dunya, what is it? It is play and joke and beauty and boasting among yourselves and seeking a great amount in wealth and children. Scholars say that these words that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen talks about different phases in our life. When we're in the dunya, we go through many phases. We're born, we don't know anything. Our limbs don't even work properly. Soon we're young children. We have certain enjoyments, certain pastimes. We grow up a little bit more. And then you enjoy playing, running around. Then you get even older, you become an adolescent. The things that you enjoyed before are no longer enjoyable. And then you go phase to phase to phase, and we're all in one of these phases. Each one of us, as I can see here, there's people of each different phase. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the very beginning, it's la'ib. When you're very young, you like to play. As a child, you play around. There's no other purpose in life for the child. Eat, sleep, grow, play. And that's their purpose. And then there's lahu. There's pastimes. When we get older, we start understanding things. We engross ourselves with pastimes. Things that pacify us from the reality of death of life. We like to have you know, different toys, watch different TV shows, cartoons. These are all pastimes which pacify us, which make us turn away from the aspect and the realization that one day we're gonna die. Right? Children, they don't like to think about that, of course. They don't think about it because you have all these pastimes. Then when we grow a little older, our teenage years, our early 20s, let's say zina, we become aware of ourselves, we want to beautify ourselves. You notice children, they don't, they don't try to uh, you know, exercise for fitness, for fitness goals and, and to look a certain way. Who does these things? Really old people, people in their 60s, 70s, they're trying to model themselves? No, children don't do it either. What is the age for that? Your late latter teens, your 20s, maybe early 30s. And a person sometimes, they're, they're very late in their development, they keep doing that into their 30s and 40s. Allah says zina. A person tries to beautify themselves, this is their only worry. And before, when they were little kids, what, what did they want? They wanted a little rattle, they wanted little action figures, they wanted a TV show. At every stage we see when we develop the previous thing, when you look at it, it's, it's useless. A person who is engrossed in fitness and wants to look a certain way and is spending all of their time and energy for that. When they look at what they used to do, they used to run around, they used to have little toys, action figures, they used to watch cartoons. They'll look down on that. Wow, I was doing this thing when I was young, I was so foolish. Little do they know that they will progress to another level and look at their level right now and say that they were foolish. Now I'm not saying don't exercise, but don't exercise for vanity. Exercise so that you can have a healthy body so that you can do the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Vanity is never a thing. You know, the body is going to deteriorate. The next stage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتَفَاقُرٌ بَيْنَكُمْ After the zina stage, the beautification stage, we get to another stage, hopefully, of maturity. And that is boasting with one another. You get a job, you get a career, you start progressing up that corporate ladder. You compare yourself with your friends. It's no longer about how your body looks, it's about how your family looks. It's about how the house looks, how the car looks. What is your status at work? And again, we look back and we say, okay, this person's engrossed with their own body, how immature. What is the next stage? After climbing the corporate ladder, getting a higher level of career, وَتَكَاثُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ When you get older and we get older, if you reach your 50s, 60s, your retirement age, what do they look forward to? Are they bodybuilding? Are they trying to climb the corporate ladder? Are they busy with toys? Absolutely not. When a person retires, what they do is تَكَاثُرْ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ They want more of wealth and they want more of children and progeny. They take pride in their progeny. I have a son, I have a grandson, I have a great-grandson. And the person who has a great-great-grandson, he's on the top. My children are doing this. What are your children doing? This boasting attitude. This is what happens when we get older. You no longer have hopes in yourself, you hope in others. And you want more wealth so that you can 
be someone who can you know be a philanthropist you can donate you can establish different <laughs> charities etc etc Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala summarizes our lives in this ayah understand dunya, the life of this world la'ibun it's play walahun it's amusement wazinatun it's beautification watafakhurun bainakum it's competing with one another boasting with one another watakathurun fil amwali wal awlad and finally it is you seeking more of wealth and more of children what does allah say about this allah then takes all of these stages and makes a comparison kamathali ghayth all of this all of these stages that every one of us is in one of these stages right now Allah says this is like a downpour, a rain. أَعْجَبَ الْكُفَّارَ نَبَاتُ The gardener, when he sees this, he becomes very happy. The gardener, again, the same example. You plant that seed, you're waiting for the rain to come down. He's very happy. Alhamdulillah, I did all I could do. I plowed the ground, I got the seed, I put it in there. Now the rest is up to Allah, the rain comes down. And then when it starts sprouting, he's very happy. Alhamdulillah, it's growing. ثُمَّ يَهِيجُوا فَتَرَاهُ مُسْخَرًا But after some time, you see the crops grow. You see the fruit come out. The vegetables come out. But eventually it's going to turn yellow. It's going to start dying away. This is what we're seeing right now. The grass is yellow. The leaves have fallen. All of the different colors of the, the fall, the autumn, they're disappearing. The trees seem dead. ثُمَّ يَكُونُ حُطَامًا After that, after it yellows, it just becomes absolutely nothing. It goes away. Where's all those leaves in the summer? Do we see the leaves anymore? It's gone. We can't even find them. They become mulch. They become, you know, they, they disintegrate. Absolutely nothing. You cannot see the leaves of last year now. You see the leaves of this year. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that this is what all of these stages is like. All of this that you're doing, all of the various stages that you encounter in your life, the things that you feel is so important, one day it's, you won't even be able to see it anymore. It's gone. It's useless. And you will look back at all of these stages and you will say, what did I do? How did I use my life? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, fil akhirah. This is the life of dunya. This is what's going to happen. You're not going to see it anymore. It's going to turn yellow. It's going to diminish. It's going to disintegrate, turn into mulch. And it's gone. You can't even find it. In the akhirah, what's going to happen? And that's where things stay. And that's the real day. There's adabun shadeed. There's going to be a very severe punishment for those who didn't use their life correctly. Notice in all of these different stages, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the general man, general individual in life. This is what they involve themselves in. He doesn't mention the individual who involves themselves in ibadah because the general populace don't. They spend their lives in these different avenues. Allah says in the akhirah, what waits for people? There's either adab shadeed, a very painful punishment, or there's going to be the forgiveness of Allah, and there's going to be the pleasure of Allah. You choose. What do you want? Do you want to follow this tirtib, this organization, this, this system that Allah has placed, this natural system? Or are you going to disobey your desires, disobey the flow of society, disobey everything, and look at what Allah wants? And cancel out the feeling of your nafs and go towards what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants, what Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam preached. So that you can have the maghfirah of Allah, so you can have the ridwan and the happiness of Allah. And then Allah wraps it up, summarizes everything in the ayah. وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَعُ الْغُرُورِ The life of this dunya is nothing except for deception. It's a deception. Think about the previous stage you were in, however old you are. Whatever stage in life you are in, if you're past retirement, think about when you were working so hard, trying to climb that corporate ladder. What does that mean to you right now? If you ask elderly people, they say, oh, dunya is so short. It didn't mean much. I spent so much time trying to get higher and higher, competing with others. It's all gone now. If you ask someone who's climbing that corporate ladder, I wish I did this earlier when I was in my teens. If I knew what I know now, I would have went so far. If you ask a teenager, I wish I started doing my fitness when I was younger so I can have that body that I wanted. Every stage, when they look back, they look down on that previous stage. Don't look down on your entire life 
in Yawm al Qiyamah. That's, that's the purpose. Allah says, don't be deceived. This is the deception. Allah mentions the stages of life so that you don't fall into them. So that you do ibadah through all of the stages. You still go through the stages, but you don't put them in your heart. You realize that the real thing in life is to do ibadah. I'm returning back to Allah. It's a test. Our example, what is our example? We signed up for the SATs. You paid $60. You went to the exam hall. Now, you don't want to waste your $60. We have a brother here. He was asking me a lot of du'as for his SATs. He needed to score a certain amount so he could go to college. Alhamdulillah, he got that score after I think three times. So it's a big deal for the, the, the youth. If we don't know what the SATs are, it's a huge test that we have to take when we want to get to a good college. So I'm not downplaying the SATs. It's a big thing. But what is our example? What are we doing with this dunya? We signed up for the SATs, paid $60, went to the exam hall. When we get into the exam hall, we look around, no one's watching, I pull out my video game console. I'm just playing. I'm playing my car game or whatever game you have you. I was going to say Game Boy, but I don't think people use those anymore. I don't know what the modern day game console is. But whatever that is, I know they have handheld games. So you pull that out, you start playing your various games. And then you're playing, you're playing, you're, you're having the time of your life. For some reason, it's more enjoyable here in the SAT hall than it is outside. Maybe because you're not supposed to be doing it. You're enjoying that game so much that before long, there's some bell or the teacher says, time's up, turn in your exam. And now you're shocked. After turning this exam, I didn't write anything. So you just start filling in random C's all the way through. Someone told me that marking C is statistically going to be more correct than anything else because it's kind of in the middle. I don't know if that's true. Someone can try it. Just put C all the way through, see if you pass. So you just put C, 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 C. And you turn in that test. And you hope. That hope is foolish. We wasted our entire time. This life is a test. We went in, we're in the exam hall right now. And what are we doing? We're playing around. We're joking. Yeah, let me pray salah, rush through, do whatever. Then I go to my real life. Whatever stage we are in, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about. Let us wake up. This is a dream. This Literally, this life is a dream. When do we wake up? When we die, we wake up. And don't let it be a nightmare. Let it be a good dream. You have control over that. Let us change, let us make this resolution, inshallah. Like I said before, our new year is in the first of Muharram. But that probably won't make a difference to many of you. You're still going to make resolutions for the new year. So make this resolution that this year I'm going to turn to Allah. I'm going to decrease my love for this dunya. I'm going to focus on what really matters. I'm not going to ignore my health. I'm not going to ignore my family. I'm not going to ignore my friends, ignore my career, but I won't let them enter my heart. I will let Allah and His Rasul, the Quran and the Hadith, I'll let those enter my heart this year. And I will start focusing on what really matters. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. This is the teaching of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah says, وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ This life is absolutely nothing. It's just deception. And if you look at this word, مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ Gurur means deception. Mata, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this word in this ayah, if I can explain the word. There was this grammarian, his name was Asma'i, very famous grammarian in the Arabic language. He had difficulty with three words. He was a master of the Arabic language. And what was famous, and now I'm going over time, what was famous amongst the Bedouins in that time period, amongst the Tabi'een, and in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's time, in Jahili as well, the Bedouins had the best Arabic. If you wanted to learn Arabic, you have to go into the village. And those people had the actual pure Arabic that didn't mix with any other language. So that's why some of the Quraysh would send their children to spend time, few years with the Bedouins, so they get a fluent Arabic. So Asma'i is a grammarian. He was traveling amongst the different Bedouin tribes. He was visiting them. He had difficulty with three words. What were these three words? One was tabarak, like we mentioned tabarak al-ladhi bi that word. He wanted to know the actual essence. 
One was Raqim. Many of you have recited Surah Al-Kahf today. Raqim is in Surah Al-Kahf. It means a dog. Right? And the third is Mata'ah, this word. So he went to the, the village and he stopped by this house and he saw something happen. There was a dog that ran out of the house. It had a rag in its mouth and it ran up the hill. So the little child comes out of the house and he screams out, Ya Umma, Jaha Raqim, wa akhad al mata' wa tabarak al jabal. And he was like, SubhanAllah. All three words, he, he, he understood them at once. Because this little child in the village who knows proper Arabic used them in one sentence. So he said, What? The Raqim came, the dog came. Wa akhad al mata' and he grabbed the rag. Al-Jabal, and he ascended the mountain. So now, mata, what does it mean? It means a rag. Something, if you take a piece of cloth, right? When you're trying to clean something, do you care what cloth you take? Whatever's dry and clean, take it, rub it on whatever you need to rub it on, and you throw it away. Open your garbage can, you throw it away. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَلْ حَيَاتُ dunya." Dunya is nothing, it is this rag in the sight of Allah, this dunya that you and I hanker over, that we would give anything for. <coughs> you take this dirty rag, you wipe it, and you throw it away. It has no value at all. And just like a rag, we need to use it for something. Use the dunya to get to Allah and throw it away. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us this realization. It's not easy to understand this. Because the power of the dunya, the test that Allah has put us in, is so strong. It pulls us so strongly that sometimes we forget. Or we should say, almost all the times we forget. It is only in these rare instances, when we hear the verses of Allah, that we get some kind of tanbih. We get some type of realization. And then we go back to that world. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow this to continue. To give us tawfiq, to make that resolution. That we are going to obey Allah. We are going to place Him... His ayat, his Qur'an, his kalam, the words of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam over everything else. And we ask Allah for a good life in dunya and the akhirah. Wa sallallahu tabaraku ta'ala ala khundi khalfihi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Rahmatika ya rahmeen.